Okay, can you hear me okay? Good? Perfect. So, thank you very much for coming this evening to hear this talk on Piltdown and the First Englishman, and hopefully I'll make a, a relatively reasonable case as to what we can think about Piltdown in the 21st century. I think it's especially relevant that I talk about Piltdown here at the Penn Museum because a component basically to this particular uh, myth, fraud, legend actually has to do with the fact that the materials were held at the British Museum of Natural History, what it was called at the time, now the Natural History Museum, and there were all kinds of issues that were associated with testing and access and many of the things that we deal with in the museum uh, environment today. I also need to tell you that, uh, and I'll show you in a slide as we go through, that we have a special connection with Piltdown. We actually have the original mold from which the Piltdown reconstruction was made. It passed to us through an interesting group of uh, processes, makes its way into our casting program here at the Penn Museum. So I think it's especially appropriate that we actually talk about this particular topic here at this museum at this time. So my introductory slide looks kind of busy, and I put it up there purposefully because the word Piltdown is in the center, that famous word, that famous site, and it's surrounded by many, many, many other names, actually of very, very famous fossils. And the interesting thing to me is that people rarely recognize, unless they're you know, real advocates and real sort of scholars associated with human evolution, these varied other names, but they do recognize Piltdown. So it does stand to reason that we spend some time really talking about it. It does have relevancy in the world today because uh, indeed it is um, a case not only of a forgery, but it's a case as to why scientists behave in the way they behave. And I think that has a lot to tell us in the modern world. So all of these other non-pronounceable names are actually the real famous fossils which are out there, and they sort of sit in the background, basically, paled okay, by this uh, big uh, center focus name of Piltdown. So anyway, hopefully I can make a case and talk about this and hopefully get, give you a real true sense of how this uh, uh, transpired and give you a sense of what we've come to understand because of this process of going through the 50 years of reworking and rethinking uh, the issues that are associated with the perpetration, basically, of a forgery. So I start, of course, with uh, the great hoax the, of paleoanthropology, and one uh, that probably set the stage for our understanding of human evolution for at least 30 or 40 years. So although it's a forgery with its little sort of set in time and in place, it really changes the way people interpreted the fossil record of human evolution for a much longer period of time. And for that, it's really deserving of its place in uh, the history of paleoanthropology. For those of you who don't know much about the story, hopefully I'll give you a little bit of a feel for the story and some of the characters that are associated with this. Uh, some of them are very famous in the field of anthropology. Some of them have taken their place in the sort of history books as being basically frauds and foragers and hoaxers and, you know, sometimes practical jokers, scoundrels, all of these kinds of things. But the story really is about a series of fossils that were planted at this site called Piltdown. Of course, it's always a good idea to start with a map, and basically X marks the spot on this map. It's on the river, and I can be corrected by anybody in the room who knows the proper pronunciation of this. I love the internet, and I did look it up. And the river, okay, O-U-S-E, I think it said ooze. Am I correct on that? I did look it up. Thank you. Good, 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 good. The River Ooze. And the River Ooze has a series of, of course, terraces that are associated with the position of the river as it changed over time. And the Piltdown fossils were actually found in one of the high terraces of that river, approximately 50 to 55 feet or so above the level of the river at the present time. Those gravels actually were used for a very long time by people in the area. They would basically 
accumulate them to make the gravel road surfaces in that area. So they were constantly going back and, and really digging in them, and it served this very practical use of making road surfaces and roadways. I will also tell you at the onset that we talk about the Piltdown site. It actually is really a name that is associated with the fossils of Piltdown because the fossils themselves actually came from three separate places in this vicinity. And I'll show you a little bit more about that too as we go through the slide set. To give you a sense of its position and you know, the issue is of course that it's in a, in a, in a, in a county in, in Sussex and that it is located close by to the town of Lewes. It's actually on the roadway to Lewes. And so it is an area that's sort of much transversed or much traveled over the course of the history of this part of um, England. The original um, geological map, if you want to call it that, was actually hand drawn by uh, Dawson. We'll talk about Dawson and how he sort of fares in this whole story of the Piltdown remains. He's either the perpetrator of the fraud or he is an unlikely accomplice in the perpetration of the fraud. We're really not so sure. But he actually goes, he finds the fossils, he does many sort of movements into this area, sort of looking around in the gravel beds, trying to actually sort through things, and actually picks through these gravels and finds a particular group of bones and tools and animal bones and things like this. And he does not have any training basically as a geologist or as an archeologist, although he is considered to be an amateur geologist and um, an archaeologist. His job is actually as county solicitor. And of course, you know, <laughs> being a county solicitor, I guess, you know, boredom set in and he began this process of actually sort of scouring the hillsides basically for interesting things to study and interesting fossils. In any event, this is his drawing. He's unfamiliar with geology in any serious sense. These are the gravels on the top of these beds that he has hand drawn in. And it's in these gravels in which we find these materials and they indeed were seeded. Just so you know, the fossils themselves were actually uh, planted, dyed, manipulated, all kinds of things. And in fact, the signature of forgery was there the entire time. Why people were blinded to this is, is another story, of course, because they were interested in finding what they really wanted to find. I love this slide, actually, because it shows people actually excavating a site in, you know, basically they're with their coats off, but nevertheless in their suits. And so this is Dawson, the person who is considered to be the primary person in the perpetration of the fraud. This is Smith Woodward, the academic kind of component to this whole story, and we'll get into the details of each of their contributions in a little bit. This is a worker, actually, that is just there basically basically to dig through these gravels. And I actually show this sort of as a highlight because indeed we do know the name of the goose. We don't know the name of this worker, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> and I've read many renditions of this and I wish that you know I could say whether or not there was truth in this or not. But the goose indeed is named Chipper. But on occasions in the literature, he's referred to as a guard goose, actually. And that he was such um, a character at the site and so aggressive at the site when people came in to try to disturb the gravels that they would be deterred, basically, from you know, messing around with the sequence and allow only the proper people into the area to actually do the excavation. So you'll see in many photographs of Piltdown and the materials and the excavations, Chipper the Guard Goose. I laugh about it a little bit, but in South Africa, we're going to talk about some of the early discoveries there because, of course, they run in conflict with Piltdown. And uh, I've been told, although I don't really have any photographs of this, that in some of those early sites, they use guard pigs, actually, to keep people from going in and looting the sites. So animals fare very strongly, actually, in the stories of human evolution. They're not sometimes given their proper place. Uh, so in this whole kind of crazy story that I'm about to tell you and this fraud that comes forward as the Piltdown fraud, it begins in a way that um, 
is a little bit hard to sort of nail. And it is indeed the case that we are unsure when the first fossils were actually found at Piltdown. Uh, some people attribute the first fossils as coming forward in 1912, maybe a little bit earlier than that. But indeed, it can be the case that the original skull, which was identified as the Piltdown skull, was actually found in 1908, although you'll see again varied dates on this, by a worker. And the worker handed the materials to the um, father of Mabel Kenwood, uh, who was the manor estate person at the time. And this, of course, is coming in a dialogue later on that she gives to uh, Weiner, who does a, a rendition, essentially, a, a, an expose, essentially, of Piltdown in 1955. And supposedly the story is that this worker basically in, in chopping through these gravels to move these gravels to make these roads, he hits something in the gravels, which he describes as a cuckoo nut. Okay? And it's often the case, again, with this sort of weird kind of parallel thing, that the first fossils which were found in Indonesia in Java were actually also described as being found by a worker and called a coconut. So we're not actually so sure that this isn't some imagination that sort of plays into the story. Uh, just by way of sort of leading into the bigger discussions on this, I'm going to tell you in advance that probably the skull is a real human skull. I mean, and, and the pieces actually go together and are part of a real human skull. The uh, thing about the skull is, however, that it is a medieval Britain skull. It's not an ancient skull. And it probably was chosen because of the thickness of the skull bone, which at the time people thought was an indication of it being old or primitive or something like that. So the skull is indeed a real skull uh, of a real person and of an archaeological context. It is probably the case that the skull was taken from the Royal College of Surgeons and was part of a pathological series of skulls which were collected there. And one of its pathologies actually was the thickness of the skull bone which was described in detail by an anatomist who came to the conclusion that this was some unusual pathology, perhaps an anemia. And it's associated not only with thickness of the skull bone, but a premature fusion of the sutures of the skull, what's called a synchondrosis. So it's a pathological medieval Britain. And that's the one that forms the core, basically, of the Piltdown story. There are other fragments which are found later on, which are salted in the site, which don't belong to this, which you know are added as sort of components, basically, to the Piltdown fossil. But this is probably a real skull. Whether or not it was found by this worker, I basically have no idea. And what the year was that it was found, I have no idea. The uh, materials were actually presented to the scientific audience in 1912 on a winter day, not super dissimilar from the kind of day that we're in right now in January, but this was in December, actually December 18th, 1912. The presentation was to the Royal Geological Society, a very formal kind of um, presentation, obviously. And the materials, of course, were given the formal genus and species name, which I will come back to also too, Eoanthropus Dawsoni, which basically means Dawn Man of Dawson. And Dawson, of course, is the discoverer, essentially, of the material. There are many professional publications which are presented on Piltdown, and I'll go through and even show you, in case you're interested, uh, pointers to a whole series of publications which have been accumulated and put into a singular bibliography. So it's seriously considered at the time. And its serious consideration is made all that much more, um, I don't know, unexplainable by the fact that the forager, uh, two years later, attempts to really let it out and let the secret come out by actually planting at one of the sites a elephant bone, which is actually artificially, I don't know what to do about that, <laughs> which is actually artificially carved 
into a cricket bat. I have to put my glasses on. <laughs> Excuse me for a minute. All right, let's let's hit that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. I don't think I'm touching anything, but in case I am, I'm going to stand back from the machine <laughs> and hope for the best. <laughs> oh, I definitely didn't touch anything. Can I continue on talking? And you have that image basically of this flat bone in your head. It literally was meant as a clarifying joke to bring out the forgery. But these people were so involved in the story, in the story and were so engaged in wanting this to be a true fossil that they overlooked what was a completely obvious joke or trick played on the people who still move forward treating Piltdown as a valid scientific discovery. Uh, it has metal uh, manipulation marks on it, all kinds of things. So clearly it is the case that we would like basically to think that the forager realizing that this is being taken seriously would like to backtrack basically and actually allow this to come out into the community before it goes completely out of hand. So what do you think about the slides there? Think it's gonna be okay? <laughs> okay. Sorry about this. It's okay? Did you want to open up all of these things or just go to the slides that were just down here? Okay, cool. There you go. Okay, it's okay. You just hit play, maybe it'll be okay. Good? It's all right still? So, uh, <sighs> I have to make a little bit of a joke here. And that is that I always say that I have the worst luck with anything associated with technology. I think I have a negative magnetic field. <laughs> I am the kind of person that when I wear a wristwatch, I can actually break it. And it just stops one day. So it's not the first occasion when I've had these kinds of difficulties. And if it doesn't come up soon, is it okay? Oh, oh let's clear a big hand. <laughs> Actually, the thing is that I'm so powered by slides these days that, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to actually talk without having them as a sort of visual kind of cue. So anyway, if we kind of get to the actual fossil finds themselves of Anthropus Dawsoni, it is the skull of a medieval Briton. They find these salted basically within the um, within the beds that piltdown down these gravel beds. And the interesting go along essentially with that uh, salted skull is the lower jaw of an orangutan, which is actually clearly something not belonging to the skull of a modern human. And uh, it, is the, it is really indeed the case that thinking how people could put these two together almost blows your mind looking at this in hindsight. But the idea was to create a truly unique kind of find and to do it in a context which really supported the theories at the time that the earliest forms in our lineage, and remember these are gonna be early Darwinians and thinking about these things, was really kind of a mishmash essentially of modern characteristics and characteristics in common with our closest uh, relatives like chimpanzees and orangutans. But it goes a bit further than that. Not only do we have the skull and the jaw, but they salt the deposits with ancient animal bones and also with a series of uh, stone objects 
uh, which actually fall into a couple of different categories, but the deepest ones or the most key ones are a series of probably naturally altered flints um, that are common and present all over Great Britain, which are called Aeolus, dawn stones. And there are many arguments at the time as to whether or not dawn stones were things which were actually modified by humans or some ancestor of humans or were natural occurrences. So the plot, basically, is to put these things together to really lend an antiquity, essentially, to these materials. At the time, and we'll go through and you'll see, there were other fossils which had been found in mainland Europe, but in England, pretty much nothing. Nothing had come forward. So there was a thirst, essentially, to find something like this. And of course, it met the pre-existing expectations that the earliest forms and the most modern forms would actually be found in Britain. At last, it seems, the missing form, the link which early followers of Darwin, Darwin had searched for, had really been discovered. Early and therefore more important than any other fossil hominid then known, at least in Europe. So this was a key piece, a key pin, essentially for the academics that were dealing with the evolution of humans. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Uh, the reason why I had said that it's very interesting and kind of key that we talk about this here at the Penn Museum has to do in large measure in thinking about museums and museums as we move forward into the future, but also this interesting connection to one of the people who actually was said to be perhaps a perpetrator of the actual forgery, a man by the name of Frank Barlow. And Frank Barlow actually Frank Barlow actually was a preparator at the British Museum and was indeed a suspect in the forgery. And he was responsible for modeling the Piltdown fossil itself into a casted form, which actually then became available to a number of scholars around the world. In a very interesting sequence of events, after his death, it was deemed that the actual molds, which were made out of plaster of Paris, it was before they had these uh, uh, flexible molding materials like latex or silicon rubber, things like this, were made out of plaster of Paris, were deemed to be actually part of his personal property and were sold to an organization called the American Paleontological Association, which is now defunct. They came to be at the Winter Gren Foundation for Anthropological Research in New York City, and then the molds were transferred by that foundation to the biggest fossil casting program in the world, the Penn Museum Fossil Casting Program. So we actually have Barlow's original molds of the individual pieces, as well as this reconstruction which was made. And so we do still produce the pieces, and some members of our audience were actually able to see uh, and to feel basically one of these castings that came from that original mold. So we have this interesting connection. The reconstruction itself was created by really two individuals who were working on uh, the Piltdown materials. This is one of the reconstructions. It was one that was actually considered to be an anomalous association, essentially of a, a relatively small brained a, a, a human skull with a very large projecting ape-like jaw. And in that reconstruction, uh, Smith Woodward, who's actually one of the people we're going to come back and talk about in detail, actually constructed the material with a large projecting canine tooth, which was later, of course, uh, forged and actually planted at the site to be found by a very famous Jesuit priest who's been associated with the forgery, too. And we'll get back and talk about that, too. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, it all comes, it all comes around. There are a ton of suspects which have been implicated essentially in uh, the forgery. And being a forensics person, as um, Steve had talked about in some detail and quite nicely, um, I do do a lot of forensic and forensic work. And whenever we talk about something like this, we actually sort of begin to think in terms of, you know, sort of three kind of key components to anything, a crime, to a forgery, anything of this nature. And the perpetrator needed to have knowledge of how to do it, 
And obviously this would be a person who had an intimate understanding essentially of anatomy to be able to do this would have had to have had the opportunity to actually see the site and actually have the materials in order to do this, and also to a motive for doing it. What could possibly be the motive? And lots of people have been implicated, as you can see this crazy looking list here, and uh, including okay, Arthur Conan Doyle, who actually was implicated basically because he lived close by to Piltdown, pretty much. <laughs> and because he liked a good yarn and a good story. So why not implicate him in this uh, process? So pretty much anybody who had anything to do with the Piltdown fossils at one point or another were implicated in the, in the, in the forgery. The person that I'm actually gonna make a case for as being the most likely candidate is actually Martin Hinton. And it's probably a name that's not sort of, you know, ringing out in your own heads as a famous person in human evolutionary studies. And indeed, it shouldn't actually ring out in that way. He was not a human evolution person. He actually wound up at the end of his career being the keeper of zoology at the British Museum of Natural History. And he started his actually sort of launch in his career at the Natural History Museum by working in the Department of Zoology with a person that probably he was trying to trick, and that is Smith Woodward, who is also listed in this great group of characters who could potentially have uh, perpetrated the fraud. The reason why I like talking about Hinton as the perpetrator of the fraud is because his motive is very base, actually. And I like that when it comes to motive. I don't know how you all feel about that. And the very base way is the following. He actually was a working man and, you know, part essentially of the working class of England. And he basically, like many in the working class, lived paycheck to paycheck. He was a devoted scientist and wanted more than anything to work at the Natural History Museum. So he approached Arthur Smith Woodward to take him on actually to do cataloging of some of the collections in the Department of Geology actually at the Natural History Museum. Smith Woodward is an aristocrat and a rule bound person. And so what transpires essentially is a very bad interaction between the two. Smith Woodward will not yield and do the following thing, which was against policy at the time at the museum. And that is pay Smith Woodward on a week, I mean pay Hinton on a weekly basis versus paying him at the end of the job being done. So they wind up having, you know, basically this very um, a strong and negative interaction and a grudge which is held by Hinton over the whole course of his career. He winds up moving from the Department of Geology to the Department of Zoology and becoming a keeper at the museum. But this is well after basically these interactions with Smith Woodward. And then the second thing, also really key, that people sometimes don't look to, but is a necessary component of that, and that is, these are early Darwinian evolutionary thinkers. Smith Woodward has thrown his hat very strongly into the ring of thinking about evolutionary process in Darwinian terms. And Hinton is a Lamarckian, a totally distinct, different, kind of way of thinking about changes in li living forms in the world. So they've got basically a kind of a grading initial interaction that carries on for approximately 20 years, and then they have this sort of theoretical rift between the two. So I think he's most likely wanting to play essentially what might have started out as a practical joke on Smith Woodward, and then extends into this great big long drama of what happens not only to just these people talking about Piltdown, but our whole understanding basically of human evolution. So I think Hinton is the guy. I also will tell you that
Many people say, why do we care about Piltdown? Why would anybody study a fraud like this? We all know it was a fake. We all know that people bought into it, and we know that it was tragic in terms of their careers. We know all of these things. But okay, it is indeed the case that many people are interested in this topic. So there is this annotated select uh, bibliography, essentially, of the forgery. You can actually tap into it online. And they even give the statistics of the number of downloads of individual publications, basically, from the bibliography. So in other words, it sounds like something in the past that maybe we should get over. But indeed, it still stands in this very central place and people really trying to understand how something like this could have occurred. So you can see the number of citations basically on individual days. And then you can see by month how many citations actually, or downloads are actually, I shouldn't say citations, downloads are actually made from that particular website. So it is far from over. In 1992, Philip Tobias, a very prominent uh, South African paleoanthropologist, wrote an article in a very um, well-respected journal in anthropology, current anthropology, and uh, he was actually implicating Arthur Keith, one of these other people, in the forgery. And Karen Anthropology is really cool because it gives the original article and then it gives commentary at the back, other sort of short versions of criticisms which are written by scholars worldwide. And in this 50-page article, there are about 20 commentaries, actually, on his 1992 presentation on the Piltdown Forgery and Keith. And interestingly to me, 13 of the individuals are actually British academics, and the rest are sort of smatherings, essentially, but primarily from the United States and Canada. And all 13 of the British commentators actually say, why are we spending any time on Piltdown? And everybody else is going, well, I think it's pretty interesting. So, you know, it's like almost like a blunder or a blot, essentially, on British paleoanthropology, which was leading or really trying to lead the field of human evolutionary studies at the early part of the 20th century. So this is the article, Cain Karen Anthropology, and you can see that there are varied reasons why Tobias actually approaches this topic in 1992. And it is you know, sort of beyond the topic of just Piltdown and attempting to understand how these things actually transpire. So it, it also, too, I think he rightly points out, it's important to exonerate some of the people who were really innocent in this whole thing. And also, too, to understand how theory can really drive a lot of people's ideas about how to situate and what to do with particular kinds of intellectual pieces of data that are out there. And it also sheds light on how people actually come to accept, reject, or convert uh, uh, ideas or theories within science. And I add my own sort of two cents on this slide by saying, that it highlights for me a very key thing and a, very, and a thing that I'm very proud to be a member of the Penn Museum based on. And that is that the British Museum at that time was closed access to scholars. So although many people doubted Piltdown, they didn't have the same voice because they actually couldn't see the fossils. So the thing is that all of us in the museum world, especially at the Penn Museum, have actually really hunkered down to make all of our collections as open access as we possibly can. So I think that this is also a testament to the importance of having as many viewpoints on a problem as you can possibly accumulate. So having said that, I need to say that, yes, I'm going to talk about the people who really put forward Piltdown, maybe committed the forgery, maybe rode their whole careers on it, but know that many, many scholars realized there was something wrong with the find. 
and virtually none of them were willing to accept that it was a forgery. They just went to the sense, I can't understand why this is like this. I don't know why this happened. But they recognized that you can't have an ancient, what they called a tertiary skull, meaning that it was probably, you'll see they had a sort of a weird sense of time in this, in this way, but old, 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 at least from their tally of old, 200,000 years, pretty old at that time. Now they're actually saying before the Pleistocene. So now we would be saying two, three million years old. So basically the idea is that there'd be no way that this kind of association could be present in this place at that time. In geology, in anatomy, and in all kinds of reasons. And again, they weren't able to actually see the fossils. It's also really key, I think, for me, who's dealing with public audiences all of the time, and uh, oftentimes I am in casual or even serious debates with creationists who often, if not always, talk about Piltdown. And they talk about it because the claim is that if a forgery was produced once, they're producing them all of the time. Yeah. So in other words, it has uh, really fueled a kind of discussion within that particular community, which is very difficult to navigate around. I'm not so sure I'm ever really convincing people that this is a really unusual or not occurrence, but it has really served as a backbone for much of the creationist literature. The other ones which are mentioned here are Peking Man, and actually, the reason why that one sort of comes to the forefront is because the fossils were lost, okay? So lost, were they ever really there? I mean, this is the kind of mentality that goes into this. And of course, then we're looking at the dinosaur and human footprints basically together in the same deposit. So these are some of the three things that frequently creationists go to when they're actually challenging evolutionists. This painting was produced in 1915, and it's actually a very important one that actually shows many of the characters which are associated with uh, the Piltdown materials. Uh, the ones that are actually implicated in producing it as a fraud are Barlow, we already talked about. Elliot Smith, probably not as seriously as Dawson, Smith Woodward, and Arthur Keith. Uh, Elliot Smith is a person who actually studied the dimensions of the inside of the skull bones and talked about brain size because, of course, the idea was that if we were finding the earliest humans, then, of course, a lot of this is based on our understanding or determination associated with brain size. The slides have been very interesting today. <laughs> the, uh, renditions which are given, okay, many of them are like this, you know, essentially these flesh reconstructions which are oftentimes produced. And the idea, of course, is to give people sort of a real sense of the time and of the peoples which are associated. This is one of these reconstructions of Piltdown. You can see the club in the hand of the individual. You can see the camels in the background, but there's also other fossils which are present there too. Again, the case being made that this is a super, super old find, older than anything in Europe. And of course, astonishingly, very modern in the face of other uh, very primitive fossils which have been found in other places in the world. Uh, the fossil fraud itself was actually not revealed for a very, very, very long time. And I also find this to be incredible. The first time the fossils were actually tested uh, was in 1949, so we're talking many years after the original fossils were described to the Geological Society. So from 1912 to 1949, no one thought to actually test the fossils. And that's what I say, you know, testing, access, all of these are really key to the scientific endeavor. And, you know, for a while I sort of, you know, you know, you know rub my hands and you know, try to get my head, you know, essentially around this, because in 1899, a huge group of Neanderthals were found in the country of Croatia. The site is actually called Krapina. There are 900 Neanderthals that were found at that site. And 
the excavator, Gorianovich Cranberger, was challenged as to their antiquity. And the antiquity was determined based on their relationship to animal bones at the site. So in 1899, they tested the contemporaneity, basically, of the animal bones to the human fossils, and were able to determine the deep age frame, essentially, of those bones. And that's 1899. Why does it take that long, actually, for anyone to come forward and to suggest the testing on these bones? It blows my mind to think about that because certainly they could have nipped this in the bud. They had the technology to nip this in the bud very, very early on when they first noticed the anomalous association of the pieces to each other. So you can see some of the uh, extravagant ways, basically, people describe this. A fantastic piece of forgery, an incredible imposter, the greatest archaeological hoax of its kind ever perpetrated, and certainly that's the case. But a lot of people allowed that to happen. The evidence itself, as I've given you a little inkling of, was hugely modified, hugely modified. Just in your face, this has to be a fraud. In person, it's been suggested that the, that the hoaxer was literally playing a practical joke. And actually, that is indeed a possibility that just kind of went awry. So what were the very things that actually sort of gave this away, gave it away even immediately? Well, obviously, you've got that orangutan jaw. So, <laughs> you know, any anatomist is going to be able to say, this can't possibly go with this skull. It is chinless, basically. It has, you know, essentially a wholly uh, unique kind of form to the bone. I don't want to go through the details of each individual part of the anatomy, but one of the key pieces is this, that the knob on the back of the lower jaw that fits into a depression on the temporal bone on the base of the skull is an absolutely identifiable feature associated with the human jaw. And so, of course, the perpetrator does the following thing, lobs off the knob. <laughs> yeah? So there is no real association, there's no articulation between the jaw and the skull. It's more than that, however. Scratches were made by a file onto the two surfaces. And the forager didn't even take the time, although they knew that humans chew differently, so the teeth had to be worn in a very particular way, but didn't take the time to actually file the teeth so they would have been working in concert or in unity with each other. Nobody can have two surfaces which are that out of alignment with each other because they wouldn't be able to process food, you see? And the scratches themselves were made with metal tools. It was easy to see that. It wasn't that brush polish that you have in just chewing, chewing with your teeth. Worse, <laughs> if it's possible. Because, of course, I don't know how you would forge this, but you know, certainly you could maybe get maybe a, a more worn tooth or something like that. Uh, what people, anatomists, realized at the time, especially people dealing with the dentition, is this. That when you wear the enamel off of teeth, there is a core, a softer tissue under the enamel called dentin. And that protects the inner living surface of the tooth called the pulp or the pulp chamber. As you wear your teeth, your teeth react by forming and protecting the pulp chamber forming a layer of what's called secondary dentin that actually is laid down to protect the pulp. So these teeth are artificially filed to look worn, and there's no secondary dentin. Okay, right away, there you go. The tooth, the canine tooth, which is actually an ape tooth, was found later. It was also filed at the tip, again exposing dentin with no core underlying secondary dentin to be shown. Obviously, the forager is uh, kind of doing a good job, but absolutely this would have been easy to see if you were looking with a critical eye. Worse in this whole thing is the effect of the Piltdown forgery 
on the acceptance of Africa as the cradle of humans. And uh, in a sense, okay, the story has that tinge, which is there and is real of racism, that Europe has to be the cradle of humans. And so what happens in 1924, a young Raymond Dart, who you can see pictured here, I'll show you some other photographs of him too, who is in part educated actually in England at Oxford, takes a post in anatomy at the University of Witzwatersrand in South Africa, and in the context of his duties as um, uh, a person in the anatomy department, he's asked to look at a curious fossil which comes from a site in uh, South Africa called Taung. And he, of course, recognizes right away that this is one of our ancient ancestors. The problem is that it's directly opposite from what Piltdown actually showed. And so rather than, you know, think or maybe work around or try to, you know, uh, um, accommodate basically these fossils. The first one comes out in 1924. A load of fossils begins to come out beginning in the 1930s. Rather than accept or accommodate these materials, they are hugely critically assessed and set aside for at least 20 years in our understanding of human evolution. So people become so tied to Piltdown that it alters the course of human evolutionary studies for a period of time. So this is Raymond Dart with the little face of this Taung baby. He publishes it in Nature, and get this one. He submits his manuscript. It's accepted for publication. And in the same issue are published critiques of that very paper. So in other words, the critiques came out at the same time as the original description of the fossil. So the manuscript had been shown to many of these people who then, of course, took it upon themselves to devalue the position, essentially, of these fossils in South Africa from their rightful position in human evolution. So yes, it's a forgery. Yes, there's this kind of crazy buy-in. But what it does to human evolution is really set it back for a very long period of time. This is Raymond Dart at the 60th Jubilee of the Tong Fossil. And now, of course, we will recognize that uh, the beginnings of the human lineage, going back into these deep time places, is actually in Africa. And Europe actually becomes, in our story of human evolution, a backwater, actually, of human evolution. It's the place where nothing happens, let alone the place where everything should possibly be happening. But it took a long time for people to leave that, okay, let that go. Uh, I can't seem to advance the slide, there we go. There were other fossils, however, too, and I need mention these as well. And I'm gonna give a bit of a historic context on how these were construed, too. In um, uh, Java, in Indonesia, in 1891, a um, European by the name of Eugene Dubois along the Solo River in Java actually found a skull cap, some isolated molar teeth, and the femur of what is now actually a group of fossils that is placed in Homo erectus. Again, hugely critiqued. And indeed, these fossils, as well as ones that we're going to look at coming from China, I accidentally advanced to that slide before I went back to this, uh, were actually, with Neanderthals, considered to be devoluted members of the human lineage. So their primitiveness in comparison to Piltdown was actually because, sorry about this, was actually because they were not members of our lineage, that modern humans had actually made the sort of uh, transition essentially in Europe, and then in other places in the world, they devolved basically into these very primitive forms. Can, can you help me again? <laughs> so this slide that I had shown you was actually the ones that had come from Indonesia, from Java. In 1921, fossils were actually found at a site called Zugudian in China. 
from 1921 to 1927, a bit of a gap in looking at this particular site, Dragon Bone Hill in China, not too far from the modern city of Beijing. Um, yeah, we can go to the next one if you can, yeah, there you go. Yeah, thank you, okay. And that, um, uh, yeah, thank you. This perfect. <laughs> and that in 1927, more teeth were actually yielded at the site. And then uh, the remains of about 40 individuals. These are the ones that were actually lost during World War II, the one that I talked about when it came to the discussions, essentially, of the creationists. So there are 200 specimens which were actually found at the site all of these showing very primitive features in comparison to the piltdown materials and a lot of opposite features. Smaller brain size, more primitive looking brain cases, and more human-like jaws, actually, just the opposite of what we had seen in piltdown. So the piltdown caper really okay, uh, altered the course of a lot of human evolution. This is a bit of a description of this. The fossils okay, were instrumental in moving discussions away first from Asia and then from Africa as being the cradle of humankind. Okay. The forager okay, was quite adept okay, at actually at producing these forms and actually modifying them in particular ways to make us think that we were actually looking at real fossils. There's no way that an orangutan jaw can actually be articulated with a human skull. You can see actually on this rendition that just some bones were actually present of the skull, not many of the, really any of the face bones and quite remarkably and quite strangely, and also quite the mark essentially of the forager, is that nasal bones were actually found at one of the sites okay, associated with Piltdown. I've worked with archeological collections for a number of years here at the Penn Museum. I've excavated a lot of skeletal materials, including in Malvern, Pennsylvania, and I have never found a nasal bone. It is this teeny weeny little bone at the root of the nose that actually is not going to stick around for any amount of time in any kind of ancient context. And here, the nasal bones and the terminals okay, inside the nose are actually preserved. Again, somebody's trying to say there is something really kind of rotten about these materials. And I'll go over and look at the teeth in a little bit more detail here. You can see the scratch marks. You can see the exposed dentin. And you can see the, um, uh, the un... Um, uh, a similar relationship of the two mole, uh, the two molars in the series to each other as they were fired, filed in an irregular fashion. This is the elephant bone, the elephant femur, which was modeled as a um, joke, almost for sure, as a cricket bat. And looking in that in more detail, they could see that the filings were present on the bone. Okay. Sorry, I'm going a little bit faster here because with a little bit of gaps on things, I. I wind up being a little bit behind. Okay, it's seven o'clock right now. The site itself has been memorialized, actually, and of course, you know, people play into a lot of the scenario basically with, of course, this is the place, you know, where the piltdown materials were found. This a monument was erected at the site, actually, by Smith Woodward in the 1940s. It was actually made a nature reserve, okay, actually early on in the conservancy movement, and then was removed, essentially, from the rolls. So the first, actually, site was actually removed from the rolls, okay, almost immediately. There were controversies basically surrounding the Piltdown material reconstructions and controversy really kind of abounded within the community that actually were talking about and put for and putting forward information about Piltdown. So this is the Smith Woodward reconstruction. This is the Arthur Keith reconstruction. And in the two, get this one. Uh, Smith Woodward has that ape-like jaw with canine. Keith has the non-projecting canine. And so, of course, you know, his thinking is that this is much more kind of, of a human jaw that's going with the specimen. He also, as an anatomist, made the case that there was no way to half this jaw on a cranium that actually had a brain size of 10, 10 40 milliliters. So he increased the brain size actually to 1,500 milliliters. Okay. Very nice little tweak, okay. Actually, and of course, they went into a big academic argument about this. Keith 
was probably the most active in actually publishing information about Piltdown and probably suffered the most. He was convinced that unlike other critters on the planet, that humans evolved early, their big brain size and their complex culture. And he began this sort of discourse by actually doing the analysis of an earlier uh, fossil discovery that turned out to be a very recent origin in England called Galley Hill. And he stayed on that course really all the way through his career. By the time of his death, and after the forgery was actually discovered, he did actually say, and this is um, fortunate for him that he was able to do this, some of the other members of this whole kind of um, mess died before any of this came forward with the scientific testing that indeed this was a forgery. He was able to say, Dart was right, I was indeed wrong. So in a sense, he you know, at least was able to you know, make that kind of statement, had the ability to make that kind of statement. Uh, a variety of other foragers have actually been presented. I haven't said that much about Dawson. Dawson himself actually, as I had said, was a county solicitor and an amateur. Many of the finds that he has been associated with in terms of his archaeological career have turned out to be frauds. They know that he was involved in a lot of sleazy real estate transition transactions. Okay. So I say this and we can think of a lot of other people that have been involved in a lot of sleazy real estate transactions. And uh, his name, of course, is synonymous with Piltdown. And he's often implicated as either one of, a, of two people basically, maybe along with Hinton or somebody else, that committed this uh, fraud. The interesting thing about Dawson is this, that in 1915, uh, basically sort of at the flurry essentially of the Piltdown uh, controversy, he became ill. Uh, the statement is made that he came down with an anemia, and by the end of the following year, 1916, he had died of what has been described as septicemia. So indeed, there was no word, you know, essentially from him after these events and when the fraud was finally exposed. And that actually holds true for the bulk of the individuals. Hinton actually did live past the time in which the fraud was exposed, and he was interviewed by Weiner, one of the people who was responsible for the scientific testing on the material. And he went to his death never revealing who was responsible for the fraud, although he did say to Weiner, uh, I know who committed the fraud, and it's somebody at the Natural History Museum. It was him. <laughs> so he never actually kind of really, really did it in the end. And then, of course, you can see Arthur Conan Doyle. I took this actually out of a Nature article that was written by a person at the Natural History Museum now and is in charge of paleoanthropology there. And he doesn't put Keith as one of the people on this list, on his sort of primary list of possible perpetrators, which I also find interesting, because again, he's one of the most prominent names in this whole thing. I do mention okay, that a very famous Jesuit priest was actually implicated in this fraud too. And I say this because probably one of the biggest names in evolutionary biology is the first, one of the first people actually to implicate Teilhard de Chardin, and that is Stephen Jay Gould. And other people have joined in actually pointing to him as being the perpetrator of the fraud. He was absolutely, at least for a short period of time, in the area. He was a person who actually found uh, the isolated canine tooth. So, in other words, it was sort of easy to kind of think and sort of pin this on him. He was very interested in evolution and very interested in human evolution. He, of course, uh, is a great theologian within the Catholic Church. I was mentioning right before we came up um, to begin the talk here that in the, one of the encyclicals of Pope Francis in, in, in 2015, he actually mentions the contributions 
of Teilhard de Chardin, basically to Catholic theology. So he's a very important person. He is a person who disavowed himself of a literal translation of Genesis and made the case or claim that all matter in the world was actually driven, essentially, forward in this orthogenic kind of pattern to modern humans and ultimately to unity, essentially, with Christ. So he was a very big evolutionist in a very unusual kind of way, at least in my sort of thinking about evolutionary process. But implicating him, he really didn't have a motive. He never published on Piltdown except, you know, a short passage. He wasn't reliant upon that essentially for his ideas ultimately on how um, fossils basically played into this pattern of uh, unity essentially with Christ. So I don't really sort of take that particular viewpoint and don't think it's a very strong case. Dawson, as I said, maybe he was an accomplice of Hinton. Hinton had the motive, he had the opportunity. We know that he actually seems to have been working with the, with the probably the hardest bone to actually sort of find and then alter was an orangutan jaw. I mean, where do you get an orangutan jaw? It's not like they're kind of hanging out out there, right? So he's in the museum. He is a member of the Department of Zoology. They have a list of orangutans, actually, that are part of the collections. And at one point, you can see a tick-off list, basically, of the orangutans. And we have many of these kinds of lists here at the museum, you know, old lists that people have made. Tick off, and there is one orangutan jaw that doesn't have a tick beside it. And it's quite possible that that's the jaw. He also had access basically to all of the fossils, and he was a big fan of ELS, okay, and finding ELS in human evolution. So sorry about this, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna actually um, ask maybe, uh, uh, um, maybe just one more time if you can kind of give it a little bit of a tweak, and I'll actually run to the end of the set, because what I want to show is the reason also, too, why many people think that it's Hinton is in 1978, he was dead in 1971, the executor, essentially, of his will actually was able to find and to go through a trunk which he had present above his offices in the Department of Zoology at the Natural History Museum. And when they went through the trunk, they found bones and teeth that had actually been altered and dyed in the same pattern as the Piltdown material. The primary agent, thank you, the primary agent of, uh, let's go to the, let's go further down. Okay. The primary agent was actually, go here, okay. The primary agent for dyeing the materials was uh, iron oxide. And actually, in fact, not only was the material dyed, but the material also, too, was altered. Um, the material, too, was altered. The material, too, was altered by um, uh, actually decalcifying the bone, taking the appetite from bone, and actually replacing it with gypsum. So then the dyes actually round, wound deeper into the bone, so they actually look like they really had that patina. So the bones, this is Hinton, the bones okay, actually are shown here from a wonderful article which was reproduced in uh, 2012. And teeth actually died to make them look like they were ancient as well. Here's Smith Woodward in, of course, all of his glory is uh, uh, aristocratic glory. And in the end, I'll end with this um, quote. Uh, the triumvirate of British paleoanthropological science was now united in believing that the Piltdown remains represented the earliest. No, no. Ah, 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 ah. Ah, 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 ah. Represented the earliest known ancestor of Homo sapiens, a unique link between humans and ape-like creatures from which they evolved. And doubtless their knighthoods, all three of them here, will bestow with an element of patriotic pride for having shown that the ancestors of Homo sapiens was an Englishman. And there is a reconstruction. Uh, Smith Woodward put this at the front of his book, The Earliest Englishman in 1948. And then a wonderful poem at the end. Um, 
Actually, I really like this one because I hadn't said before, but Piltdown was thought to be a skeletal material of a female, and the vanquished she, uh, uh, she aside would, sh would shove, and to the victor give her love. Uh, just as in modern times we find rude strength appeals to female mind. So I said, you know, basically, isn't that say it all? Not only is there racism, but a little bit of sexism. What a great way to end a story. So anyway, I'm sorry about the slide problems on this. And uh, I had about 10,000 more slides to show in there. <laughs>